let's go ahead and get started. Five o'clock, and so um, we try to start on time, right? Yes. It's not What's that? It's your official down. Oh, I gotta go. <laughs> you know, you know what that reminds me of. <laughs> One time I was. And uh, uh, they said, hey, Frank, how are you doing? You know, and they Kay. said, yeah, I got a badge for you. And they handed me a badge. Is it on? And I was walking around for We're about, good? Uh, okay. minutes. And then I realized We'd like to welcome everybody here for our first uh, <laughs> legislative. <laughs> and it's, uh, thank, you. thank you. We would like to, this is the, something we'd like to try to, to do on a regular basis if our legislators are are open to that I think we got the idea from uh, one of the things that we do supervisors association is every year we do a summit and we have a panel of legislators come and we have discussion on some of the things that each of the counties have that we'd like to introduce to legislation to help us this is, uh, and thank you for all the individuals that are here, and those of you that are joining us on Facebook Live. Just so you'll know, this is also being recorded, and it will be on the county's YouTube uh, site, so that you'll be able to reference to some of the things and even hold some of these guys to what they're gonna say. So feel free to say things freely. Um, we also, uh, just some housekeeping, one quick, we've got the bathroom over here to the side. I just want to make sure everybody's aware there is a trash can that's blocking the doorway. When you go in, just make sure that you put the trash can back. Otherwise, we're locked and we, nobody else can use the bathroom. So just make sure it's okay. It's safe to shut it while they're in though, right? Okay, cool. All right, all right. You can get out. That's the point I'm trying to get at. So don't worry about that. <coughs> Just, just real quick, I want to share with you something that uh, before we ask Supervisor Miller to give the pledge. Um, when I first got, uh, when I first became elected, um, I got a phone call from one of these gentlemen that's sitting up on the, the panel here. And his question to me was, what can I do for you, Supervisor Goodman? I was a little bit taken back off of that question because I, I don't believe I've ever been accustomed to one of our government representatives asking me what they do can do to help us. And that meant a lot whenever that particular individual, that legislator reached out to me and asked me that. And so as we go forward in some of these things, you know, we, we work together and, and trying to improve our districts and improve our communities and our county. And we appreciate the service that you gentlemen, and I think Kelly, she wasn't able to make it tonight, but those individuals that are serving us, we appreciate your time and effort. So with that, I'm gonna ask Supervisor Miller if he'd lead us in Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to introduce. We have our four our, our four panelists. We have seated to the far right, um, Representative Fillmore. Thank you for being here, John. Then next to him is T.J. Shope. Thank you, you for your time. Uh, Frank Pratt, Senator Pratt. Thank you for being here, and Pleasure. Representative Cook. In the middle. Some of you may or may not know Stan. I'm gonna give you a little bit of introduction. He's gonna be our moderator for tonight. Stan is a native Arizonan, fourth generation, right? That's right. Okay. He uh, actually grew up here in Pinal County. His family, the Barnes family, farmed in this area. So he comes from a cotton farming family. And so we appreciate him for being here. 
for the past 30 years, he's been the consultant, or he's been, he is now the president of Copper State Consulting Group. I know he doesn't look, even look 30 years. <laughs> but he is the Copper State Consulting Group. He's the president of that. Uh, Stan has been involved in every facet of Arizona governance and media and his views as, as a seasoned and well-reputable -rep veteran of Arizona politics. If you ever watch some of the news, he's the guru that they go to a lot and ask him for his commentation on, on what's going on to give kind of a, a brief view of what the landscape is. Uh, he was elected as a state representative at 27 years old. He served two terms as the Arizona in the House, and then he ran for the State Senate where he served as Chairman of the Government Reform Committee, and he also participated in a delegation that uh, went to Australia, and this was elected of state leaders that went to Australia and toured on a diplomatic, a diplomatic status for the sta uh, United States. He's highly regarded, like I said, as a political commentator, and so that, with that, I'd just like to turn the time over to Stan. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. I appreciate that, Supervisor Goodman. It's good to be back in my home county. Uh, it's good to be with the live audience. And for, for those of you who are tuning in via Facebook, I hope you can see my good-looking face and hear my baritone voice. Uh, I think you're in for a, a fun hour, at least. Um, this is self-governance. This is how we do it. This is America. We have elected officials, even on the ballot, talking about what's going on in our community and in our state. And uh, this is the best of America. I'm proud to be a part of it. Supervisor Goodman, thanks for ramrodding this and creating it. I want to acknowledge also that Supervisor Steve Miller is here uh, from Pinal County, which I'm grateful for, and also uh, the mayor of Queen Creek, Gail Barney. I grew up uh, at the corner of Ironwood and Ocotillo, for those of you from Pinal County that understand that, in the northwest section of that, of that intersection. My grandfather went out there in the 30s with, uh, as I like to say, with his woman, his shovel, and his mule, and turned a square mile of desert into a cotton farm. And that's just not done very often these days. Of course, they had no air conditioning, no running water, I mean, you name it. And then just my dad to me, I drove by that farm on the way here, and I don't recognize a dang thing about it. Not only is there a Taco Bell where my house used to be, but I think it's one of the busiest intersections in all of Pinal County, <laughs> which uh, I, I just don't, I feel like I'm in a dream when I'm thinking about it. So I, it's, it's really an honor for me as a hometown guy to be a part of this program. I, I was in the legislature. I, I served in a in the Senate but then have been uh, a consultant trying to fix political problems for folks since 1997. So I've been doing that a great deal longer. I know everyone in the legislature. I really enjoy these four gentlemen. Uh, Pinal County is fortunate to have uh, reasonable, hardworking, thoughtful people trying to do the public's business. And that is part of this. So again, Supervisor Goodman, thanks for putting this together. Not every county does this. And not every place in Arizona is as fortunate to have this kind of representation. So you've already introduced these gentlemen along the way, so I'll skip that. And I'll, I'll kick it with Mr. Fillmore, who, by the way, in his previous term years ago was just as grumpy as he is today. He hasn't changed a bit. Um, when we talk about Pinal County, there is no way to mention Pinal County without mentioning the word growth in the same sentence. I mean, this is the nature of us. I just told you my family farm story, right? Taco Bell and a Culver's and a Safeway where our corral and our house used to be. That's in the space of 50 years. What's the next 50 gonna, gonna be like? Is Pinal County going to fulfill its destiny in the, in the growth corridor of, of the state of Arizona? As state level legislators thinking about that kind of thing. <laughs> Stan, I think the first thing you have to do is get through 20 a year. <laughs> yeah. Go figure. Uh, not only with uh, the coronavirus, but the political situation. It is unbelievable growth. Opportunity abound out there. Uh, I foresee myself I, uh, down the road uh, 
uh, community sprouting up. Uh, I see Santan, uh, its form of government changing from what it is now. I see uh, individual store. I see uh, once the highways are in and the, and the growth goes down along the quarter, I see the growth coming from Casa Grande over towards, uh, 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 what is that highway number that goes down there? Yeah, yeah through your town. <laughs> You know, uh, I see a lot of growth. I see a lot of opportunity. And I think it's all going to be done and it's going to be managed. And, uh, you know, uh, it would be great to say that I might be around to see some of it. I doubt it, but uh, it's coming. That's the kind of optimism I've learned to expect from you. I appreciate that. TJ, uh, Representative Shope, what, uh, what about Pinal and growth? What about your hometown of Coolidge? Well, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, yeah, we're on the cusp, and I think I feel like we've been saying we're on the cusp of something great uh, uh, for a while now, but it just keeps on happening. Tim Knavel in the back of the room keeps at what is possible here in Pinal County, uh, whether it's uh, Lucid Motors or any of the other major employers in in various stages of stages of construction. Uh, something or to borrow a, something that Mike Goodman county government, how we're able to help other local an association of governments. And one of the things I know structure. And, and you can go ahead and have a grow, but unless you have a can take care of the needs of the citizens, uh, it could just be a that we are turning a corner. And I'm very to see how, how that goes moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pratt, I, your turn for a moment. I, you know, growing up out here, it was like Mayberry RFD, and you could hitch a ride downtown and jump in the back of someone's truck, and, and that was fully expected as you went down the dirt road. And now there's no such thing as that. And I'm, I'm wondering about the legislature's role in either facilitating the building of roads or that north-south corridor, or, or is, is the legislature just going to get out of the way and let uh, economics and nature take its course? Because we have, we have land, we have weather, we have a great tax base, we have a welcoming governance that wants to build things. Where are we in Pinal County on growth? Well... Uh, it's it's uh, great to be here. Uh, let me start uh, uh, before I get into uh, some of the other things. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Lucid. That's uh, uh, really I think they're supposed to build their first car. Uh, it's coming up pretty quick. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the date is, but to uh, see a field out there and then uh, just watch a factory be built and, uh, and knowing that they're going to be building the cars of the future uh, is really kind of mind boggling. Uh, we get to talk to the people that, that are, uh, they've got crews that are there that are building the construction. Uh, we've got crews that are, uh, they're, uh, they're doing the paint work. They're already planning on the painting of the cars and things like that. Uh, it's going to be a, a huge, huge uh, employer. I think it. I hope that it uh, really gets, really gets uh, to uh, be a real factor in Pinal County or, or in the Casa Grande area. Does the legislature have a role in any of this? Uh, I would like to say that we did, uh, but the reality was is that. Uh, they, there were a lot of uh, support from the county uh, officials and then they back basically got the job done. We were there to assist them uh, in a lot of ways. We, were, we had an opportunity to, uh, uh, they, uh, they, and rather than a groundbreaking, uh, uh, it was a building raising, I think they called it, or, but, uh, but we've been there at those events. We've always been there for them for whatever, uh, whatever we can do to help. 
and they are aware of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, th this has happened uh, with uh, a lot of other factories in the same area. You know, uh, we've got a huge uh, distribution center now with Walmart right there. Other companies are, are, are basically finding the area and uh, it's, it's growth. I mean, uh, there was, uh, there was uh, one neighborhood that was uh, just literally empty uh, lots, uh, you know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Now they've already got a bunch of houses framed out there. So. Interesting. I, I, Mr. Cook, uh, it's your moment to say hello. I, you're known as an activist uh, lawmaker. You, you, you're kind of like the Irish guy who says, is this a private fight or can anyone get involved? And I wonder, when you think of your, your district and that swath of Pinal County, are, are you excited for it? Are you anxious for it? Do you have thoughts about the legislative role in it? Stan, I want to I want to say uh, one that is here tonight personally. I want to thank all the people for getting involved in the government. Uh, I'm proud to do this, but there is something that I can on an airplane. So when it, when it's time for me to go, and it's just a travel time, so I can get to the gate. I'm going to have to leave. So if there's a question that the audience wants, or Stan, you want me to answer specifically on your list, then let's chop to it, and I'll forward all my time then the rest of this forum to the other members to answer those questions. The original question was about Brown County and the growth, and whether or not the legislature has had a past role or a future role in it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So absolutely. The, the legislature has had a past role because everything that we've we've done since I've been elected, and I'll go back and say this, and I don't want to be careful. I live in District 8. The two people up here to my left, they were my representatives for four years before I got elected. I voted for them. But we were missing God's intention was to have me be that third wheel to where we have that could not be done in 17 years at what they call down there at the state legislature. I'll go back and say this, is that we have a dual enrollment for the first time in high schools in District 8 today. At the tax dollars in which legislative districts are paying and not getting back. That was done, all three of us together down there at the legislature that for years was not getting done. I'm going to get to the real meat and potatoes here in a minute. Well, we've all, Go ahead, keep going. What we've also got done is that our education <laughs> service to the uh, school board. Hate mailers too about how you don't care for education. <laughs> we have funded and we had an all Not on inflation, you can spend those things, but we're at eleven thousand dollars per student. That's an all-time high. That's and what the people that up here represent you've done. That we've in this district with Johnson Utilities and other and other places like that. But there has to be a balance between a willing seller and a willing buyer and what government's role is. And I, and I want to get right into that is that I did a news release and there's a letter that went out today is that I supported my colleagues support the willing sell uh, and purchase of Johnson Utilities to EPCOR for all the right reasons that we know need to be done. But it's and that's where we're at today and I, and I want to say it's a bright future. One of the most important things that happened in this district was the ad hoc water summer, which was determined that 12 million acre feet of water for development had already been overextended in the 100 year water supply. So what that means is that build this, we're good to go, right? Build it, they'll be there. But yet, because of the modeling, they project a downfall. And, and so thank you, for I asked to share that committee. What is the future of Pinal County? We want, right? We can have all the and I think that determining what water is available, how we're going to model, model it, and how we're going to measure it, and then how we can of what we have, and also how can we bring new water to Pinal County. I don't know my time, but 
that's what it's about. What are we going to do? Superstition vistas. And you said in 50 years it's coming. What is that? 2.5 million people they project from Highway 60. You mentioned and questioned about the North-South Corridor. I ran the bill and talked to Senator Pratt and T.J. Shope. What to fund the Tier Two study of the North-South Corridor? The legislature. Did and as long as I'm here, we're going to stand up to our commitment to people of this district, which they've been working on the North-South Corridor for 19 years. Think about that. 19 years. And now we're going to in front of the growth in Pinal County for as long as I'm here, working to we're going to make sure the infrastructure will match what the building that happens. That would be my goal and dream. I appreciate that. You can see the problem with Representative Cook. He gets that microphone and takes it over. We've, we've done the whole gamut of issues. We're going to get to some of those, including water, in just a moment. Mr. Fillmore, back to you. Uh, he touched on this this uh, esteem issue that my home county has and that is you live here but you have to drive to Rome from the colonies for your employment you have to leave Pinal and you have to go to Maricopa County in order to have a job we have automobile development we have other, we have Walmart we have other great things happening but is in our lifetime is that going to change are we are we going to be a bedroom county or are we going to be something better no, you're going to be something better, Mr. Barnes. And, you know, I represented this uh, area eight years ago, ten years ago, uh, when I was first in the legislature. And back then I spoke about Pinal being the heart of the state. And at that time I looked at uh, I-10 and said that we were a restricted artery because we had not widened I-10 to get the, the movement of traffic coming back and forth and through that. With what the Board of Supervisors have done over the last four years, bringing in the automobile manufacturing and things of that nature, and that we are going to see the growth. We're, we're going to see people from Maricopa County and Pima County driving north and south. And the growth is going to be, if we get the developers to start building the, uh, the homes out here, build it and they will come and they're going to come in a heartbeat and they're going to bring a lot of money and they're going to bring a lot of opportunity and that's what i said uh, when i first started when when you talk about pinal this is the center of the state the heart of the state and this is where the growth is going to be and i, I really believe that's going to happen representative shope do you share that agreement oh uh, most definitely uh there's not a doubt in my mind i mean from from the job opportunities that we've been talking about earlier already to the fact that um, uh, uh, the work that we do with the Arizona Commerce Authority, it's probably not a handful of days that go by that I'm not in touch with the folks at the Arizona Commerce Authority about what other uh, great things we have going on. Had a good meeting with the county manager last week about many of the awesome projects that are on the on the, uh, uh, the near sighted uh, uh, the near side of what we are where we're at right now. Um, some of those obviously have non-disclosures at this point so we can't talk about every single one of them and I couldn't even be informed of all of them but uh, the reality is this we have to hope and we have to keep working very hard with entities like the Commerce Authority to make sure that people don't have to drive an hour to get to work on a daily basis and an hour to get back I can tell you right now and talking to John Halikowski the director of ADOT uh, they would like to get Pinal County to a situation where the directional traffic isn't all one way in the morning and all another direction in the evening. Uh, it makes engineering sense uh, as far as our highways are concerned uh, to have a, a good ingress and egress in and out uh, at different points of the day. And I think that is most definitely the goal uh, of this county board that you have, uh, the county leadership as far as the unelected uh, upper level staff as well as the folks sitting up here. Uh, we work, uh, and I especially work hand in hand uh, with the Commerce Authority to make sure that Pinal County is at the forefront of these job opportunities. And sometimes that means that the West Valley has to maybe wait another turn or two. But uh, I don't represent the West Valley. I represent uh, Pinal County. Thank you, Representative Shope. Uh, Mr. Cook, Representative Cook, I know you need to leave, so I'm going to give you another shot and skip over Mr. Pratt. Sorry, Mr. Pratt. Um, <laughs> Talk to us about Pinal County coming into its own and not being just sub Maricopa County. 
Well, the people the people that are, are living in Pinal County or choose to live here, there's I've only lived in two counties, Gila and Pinal County in the state of Arizona, but the people that uh, they have an ownership, you even referred it to your home county and, and we know where you live, right? And so it's home to you and that's what the people are here. People want to live out in the country and open space and areas and things like that, but where they also want to live, Stan, and I think everyone in this room would agree, where it's affordable, where your taxes are affordable on your home, right? Where your sales tax is affordable, where your county taxes are affordable. And, and what we see now is that some of these uh, big cities in Maricopa County and the leadership that they have in defunding the police and raising taxes and all that stuff, they are driving people out of those long-term communities and they're searching for somewhere to go. It's not just Californians, right? It's just not people from Oregon. It's people from Maricopa County that are searching for a place to go and Pinal County is, is the future of this state and where I think the growth is gonna come from. And I can give you a little snippet of why I think the jobs and creation's not here, but I can give the answer also to where that's gonna change. Well, and you have a, another moment if you'd like to take it, because I know you need to, to get going. Yeah, uh, when that phone goes off, I, I mean, that's just only, I've already mapped it out. But, but so here's the problem. This is one thing. You heard Mike Goodman say that when I got elected, the first thing I did is call up all the supervisors. Steve uh, took everybody, paid for lunch myself, the sheriff, county attorney, and said, listen, I need to know, give me what you want, give me what we need at the legislature, and I'm because I'm going in all, all eyes wide open, right? I got a couple of good seatmates to, that I can meet with and talk to, but what do we need? And I was sitting over at the airport off the 24 at Mesa Gateway, and I was in a meeting, brand new legislator, I looked up on the map, and here's the airport, here's the map, here are all these farm fields, you know, here are all these tech companies, here's all this building, manufacturing, and all that. I said, hey, what's that street where that line's at? They said, that's Meridian Road. I said, that divides Pinal and Maricopa County, right? Yeah. Well, then I looked it over to Ironwood, and then once I started driving, I'm like, well, that was pretty genius. They, they did not, by accident, not give us a north-south route to, to US 60 through Pinal County from Hunt Highway. That was done on purpose. And that was done years and years ago to keep development placed in the Maricopa County line. One fries, one Circle K built on the Pinal County side is millions of dollars of revenue to this county and to the citizens of this county that wouldn't be going over there. You see what I'm saying? And so we are changing that. We are changing that in the past four years and, and whether it's, it's uh, Meridian Road, Signal Butte, Crisman, and the great things that the mayor, raise your hand, Mayor Barney, I mean, that's the stuff we've been working on, and uh, we're going to continue to work on that stuff. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Cook. Uh, Mr. Pratt, now your turn. Senator Pratt, um, tell us about your vision about Pinal County not being just that county south of Maricopa, but being its own. Well, we have all the natural resources for growth. Uh, we've got the land. We've got, uh, we're, we're building up a huge uh, employer base uh, there's a lot of people that that will uh, be here for the employers that are of, of the future so those those things are all in place um, the some of the things that uh, are going to be moving very rapidly is a, a completely different kind of economy uh, I have one the, this kind of ties into your first question. Uh, as a legislator and the, on the the vice chair of the uh, basically the transportation and uh, public safety committee, I will have meetings that I'm going to be uh, being involved in uh, before uh, well after after the election. Uh, so we're we're already working on some of the bills that that the Senate is going to be working on while I'm not even there but uh, hopefully TJ will move into that position and uh, we're going to work on some new transportation uh, issues uh, the infrastructure that uh, that's going to be necessary for a number of the new uh, employers in the future 
uh, both uh, the transportation segment and then a lot of the uh, high tech people will be uh, coming into Pinal County. Appreciate that. Uh, TJ, let's go with you, Representative uh, Shope. Uh, Mr. Cook talked about it, and I think they're all related. It's, it's if, if growth is us, it's infrastructure, but it's not only highways, it's water. Mm -hmm. I think the water thing is, is a really difficult issue. And I, I might add, before I forget, that I understand those watching by remote are hearing some feedback in the microphone, so I'm told we ought to be careful about being too close to the microphone, so be aware okay. of that. Um, the, talk to us about that intersection of, of, of water, what it means, and, and roads, what they mean, the legislative role, that sort of thing. Can you sum up everything in about two minutes? Yeah, <laughs> sure, absolutely. Uh, no, I, it's, there's no secret here. Um, as we've seen in, in local media all across this county, uh, water is is continues to be uh, an issue that uh, is either going to hold up growth or allow growth to occur, right? Um, and we have seen it. Now, I, th I have, and I think I share with my colleagues up here, my own ideas of how the Department of Water Resources handled uh, some of the modeling for 100-year supply, et cetera, and am among other things. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, David and Steve have been working very hard on some of that uh, uh, on that issue, but you're absolutely right. It is going to be uh, a thing that, that continues to creep in, uh, not just for the development of new projects, whether they be housing or commercial projects. We have to remember that many of these high-tech industries that are, we are hoping to attract do require a lot of water uh, uh, whenever they are, are implemented in, in our area. Uh, and it also revolves back to uh, quality of water. I mean, I think David hit on it earlier. I mean, we've had a situation here for many years in this uh in this area uh where thankfully and i think you know he's obviously not here but and uh andy tobin uh took a took a big leap a couple years ago and mike you and i got in a little trouble over that meeting i think uh at one, at one point in time but but uh we, we i'm glad we did it and here we are today and we have a willing buyer and a willing seller uh, and that's where hopefully this area specifically is going to be the one that reaps the benefits of that going forward because I, I am almost 100% certain that there have been uh, developments, both commercial and industrial, uh, as well as residential, that have been uh, in the queue or held off just because of that situation. Mm -hmm. But the uh, uh, to quickly get on, on road transportation, yes, absolutely. I know 24 has been brought up. Uh, North-South corridor has been brought up. Interstate 10 has been brought up. All of these things play into the equation. Uh, we need to have a serious conversation. Now, Pinal County does have more road miles than almost any other county in the state as far as state highway system. However, a lot of those road miles are not where the population uh, resides. So what does the future transportation look like vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, state uh, highways, uh, maybe future state highways uh, throughout uh, to and fro uh, when uh, they would like to? Appreciate that, Mr. Fillmore. We're, are we in your district? Are we right now, presently? You're Who's district? No, Our yeah. district. Oh, okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, it's been brought up a couple times. The the EBCOR Johnson Utilities thing. I, I think that's an important thing. How, how do you see it? You see it. You share what TJ says that that might unlock uh, a certain happening in this area with with more development and getting that uncertainty out. Uh, Water in general. Whatever you want yeah, to do on this. Uh, uh, before David runs. I think David, who has been, in my mind, the water expert, I would like to like have his input on the water stand before I uh, answer some of the things, because I live in Pinal County. <coughs> I am north of Apache Junction. I'm more urban and more tied in with the uh, Maricopa side of the issue. When I talk Maricopa County and growth, and I, I, I think about things of that, I, I'm still talking about the Pinal Airport with its capability of having 747s landing down there, the opportunity of a duty-free zone in, in that area. I'm still thinking of the uh, the railroad and the switching yard down at Picaco Peak mm -hmm. and all of the jobs that that would suck up from Tucson and things of that nature. Um, you know, I, I can sit here and things, uh, uh, think of things that I remember years ago I would rail about. For instance, Maricopa County uh, MAG getting the majority of the money 
ones because they had all of the exit and entrance ra uh, ramps. And I said, that's BS. We're the center of the state, and we should have more, and would try to look at justification. I, I think that if I could impact upon anybody, I believe that the Board of Supervisors here have that. And, and you just look back 5, 10, uh, 12 years ago when we had the growth here in Santan, when we had the cheap land and the builders and they were coming in and paying the impact fees before uh, the former county manager uh, uh, absconded with a few dollars there, <laughs> I remember. We don't talk. No more. But, you know, we had seventy and $80,000 homes popping up, and it was like a sponge sucking people in from, uh, from Maricopa County to come down here. And I, I think that if we get the, um, uh, the income base uh, or the, um, the increase in uh, businesses down closer, down around Eloy, and Casa Grande, that's where the big effect will come. But I can't speak on the water. I'll be the first to admit it. I, that's not my shortcoming. David has always been, in my mind, the authority. When last year, uh, when you know we were going through the the war, I looked to him for his advice. So before you. you run, David, espouse, please. I think Representative Fillmore just took the moderator position <laughs> and has handed it to Representative Cook. I. And he's got a point. You led on water, uh, especially for your home county. DCP. Talk yeah. to us about. Yeah. So, so now that we've gotten through DCP at the House, one of the things that I think that, and this is this isn't one of those. Excuse me for language. This is one of those sexy issues. It doesn't pull well with voters. People aren't care. There, it's COVID, education, security, neighborhoods, but the underlying work that has to get, still get done is the water part. Right? Is water. And so if we look at the Cibola transfer for Queen Creek and stuff, that was a very important decision that the Department of Water Resources was making and guiding the state's future. And the question is, if I live down on the Colorado River and I have water rights, can I sell them to people in Pinal County? Now that's a huge question. Water is a complicated legal issue. And what the department found out was that, okay, we're not going to let you sell all of your water because what does that make the land worth in Yuma County if they sell all of the water that belongs in Yuma County or any other river county, right? But, but what, what does that make that worth? So if you have more water allocation that is from the Colorado River, which is probably over allocated as well if we got into that, if you have more water, then we can allow you or to approve the sale of the water that is above and beyond what the needs of that land for future development or farming is. So you've got extra water, you can sell your extra water to Queen Creek. Now that's important and we have to ask ourselves why because if we go back and look at Ak Chin, Ak Chin sold water because they have no groundwater rights, they sold water to Anthem in northern Phoenix to get their 100-year water supply. If we go back to look at Gila River Reservation, who sold Salt River Project about 24, 25,000 acre feet of water, right, for super system vistas and the future of that 100-year water supply, what I think is we have to remember, willing buying, willing seller, and what is legal and fair, where we don't say, well, it's okay for one person to have constitutional and rights but it's not okay for you to have the same constitutional and rights to, for yourself as well, which this is the bottom line question. Isn't the sale from Ak Chin and wouldn't the sale be, and this is a legal question that I want to get to the bottom of, and wouldn't the sale from the Gila River Indian community, if they're selling Colorado River water to SRP for that development, isn't that a water transfer off the river? So why is that water transfer okay to go to Anthem Right or go to Superstition Vistas, and that's okay for that water transfer, but it's not okay to go to Queen Creek. And those are the, some of the things that we're looking at for the future, but like I said, it's not one of those exciting topics to talk about. But thank you, Mr. Fillmore, for your kind words. Uh, that's where the work gets done, and, and, I, and once again, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, TJ, Frank. We've, we've had a busy day together, and uh, Stan, I appreciate everything you're doing for you everybody. Bet, you bet. Yeah. Thank you uh, for being here, Representative Cook. Mr. Uh, Senator Pratt, um, what are, your district includes the, the Santana Valley? 
area, right? Yes, it does. And the, so what about the EPCOR Johnson Utilities deal? What would some words on that for us? Well, um, we've been, uh, I've, I've been talking with uh, EPCOR for a number of, uh, well, the two years that they've been uh, operating this. Uh, they they uh, send me uh, as uh, the vice chair of uh, water in the Senate. Uh, I I'm well aware of what all of kind of activities are going on. Uh, they they keep me. They're very good about keeping me informed. I've been to a lot of forums, a lot of uh, meetings in their in the area. Uh, I wrote a letter. Uh, in support of the uh, change in ownership, so uh, I'm, I'm on record for being doing, you know, on that uh, on that side, if you will. Going to be good for your constituents in that area. Uh, Is it going to be good for your constituents in that area? It will be. It will uh, not only it will uh, increase uh, growth, it will bring stability into the area. Uh, there, there have been, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the area in Pinal County has just grown, and and without the the proper management, and so I think that uh, we're doing what is a, a step in the right direction, and I think it will be good for Johnson uh, Utilities and for EPCOR and and all of the area, all of the East Valley. Representative Show, before we leave that topic, uh, take a shot at, you know, there's 80,000 plus people in unincorporated Pinal County right there in your district. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of role about incorporation or not and infrastructure or not. Uh, um, I might add as an aside, when I was a kid, there was nothing there, zero. And there it is. And, and you're representing them. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm wondering I, if, if it's going to get better or oh, I, are we going to struggle along. I have no doubt. I mean, look, I, I could see a sea change a handful of years ago. I think it was uh, shortly after uh, you know, Mr. Goodman and I got together to talk, start talking about a lot of the, his plans for what the area uh, would look like in the future. Um, signed a letter at that point in time uh, shortly after you were elected, I think, the call on the Corporation Commission to install an interim manager. Uh, to remove uh, Mr. Johnson from running the organization. Mr. Pratt's joined on with that. And I think later on, Ms. Townsend uh, joined on uh, onto that. So this has been going on for some time. Um, you know, this has, has been uh, going on for a time before then. But until we had friends that were willing to take a look at the position at the on the Corporation Commission who were willing to take a look at this, and I'd credit Justin Olson and Andy Tobin for really getting in there and trying to shake things up uh, on this issue. So that has allowed us to go ahead and really push to where we are today. And I think that there are a number of things that the board is going to bring forward uh, next session uh, to make sure that something like that never happens again uh, in this county. And I'm very supportive of that. Uh, as far as, as incorporation goes, I've, I've said since 2013 that I think that that is something uh, to be decided by the folks who reside here. Uh, and any way that I can be helpful in doing so, I want to be helpful in doing so. I know that there's an effort, uh, for example, um, I was part of when I was on the school board here in Coolidge. I mean, we've got a, we had a situation where this area was, you know, had three different school districts. And Florence, uh, you know, that made it, a, I think, a better homogenous community, uh, uh, taking that portion uh, in Santan Valley. And I was fully supportive of that. Uh, I know that there's talk of a fire district out here. You know, if that's what the community wants, I have told a couple of the folks who are involved in that, I want to be the person to help you uh, at least get the answers that you're looking for. Make sure you're talking to the right people on how that would be best done. Um, so there are any number of ways that this community can control its own destiny. And I've viewed my position here to, to help in any way that I can. And I think for the first time in a long time, we have kind of a, a, genu a general uh, idea of where that would like to be taken. And I hope to be helpful going forward. Excellent. All right. Uh, for planning purposes, we're going to do some talk about COVID. We have to, right? We have to have sure. COVID. And then I want to hear from all of you something about your view of the 2021 regular session 
and then we're going to go to audience questions. And by then, we'll be about finished. Is that good, Mr. Goodman? OK, good. So Representative Fillmore, to start with you, uh, COVID, you don't look like a mask wearing type of guy to me. And maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But that's become the politics of 2020. So well, talk to us about the legislature and your district and COVID politics. OK. <laughs> I want everybody to know that in March of last year, with the onset of COVID, I stood in the state legislature, I stood up and I said, I believe my president and my governor have been misled. And the house fell down just like the plaque. <laughs> <laughs> what I said was that I believe that uh, the uh, COVID-19 was not much more serious than uh, the bird flu, the uh, epidemic we had a few years ago. Uh, I look at the numbers still today. Uh, I've seen the the numbers thrown out to the American people and the restriction on our our rights and and the, the destruction, of, the traumatization of our kids going to school and having to wear masks and things of that nature, that I personally think are unfounded. For I I believe I'm one of these old school people that says. You got a kid, the first thing you do is you've got to tell him to go out and play in the mud so his body can build the antibodies that he needs for his immune system as he grows. Uh, I uh, make no qualms about it. I don't think that the government has the right or authority to keep it. It has been. Uh, I am hoping that I can get some legislative push to help make changes to that when we go into session. Uh, I would like to see the governor to. Uh, uh, get rid of the mask to lift the shutdown to allow us to go back to working common sense it had we instituted it last March when I said I didn't think it was that good the average businessman knows to focus hey wash your hands keep a little bit of a distance but shutting down the businesses and, uh, and the trauma that, that our people have experienced to me is atrocious uh, on that I'm gonna toss the ball to someone else because I'll keep getting myself deeper and deeper in trouble <laughs> with people yeah, thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Pratt, COVID, uh, do you agree, disagree? What are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, my, my, my comments on the year of the virus, I mean, you know, it, it's obvious that it, it, this is the year of the virus. It, uh, it was something that uh, just kind of snuck up on us to some degree. Uh, we didn't handle it probably as as easily as we uh, should have but we were dealing with some real new type of a new really new type of virus that uh, we just we uh, we were doing the best job we could at that time with the information that we had I think the governor did a fine job of uh, handling the thing as as basically he could uh, just simply because it was an unknown and there were so many variables now moving forward we're going to have to deal with a whole lot of other new issues uh, how how are we going to handle education how are we going to handle new employees uh, are we going to have to rewrite the rules are we going to have to have legislation that's going to hold some of the businesses uh, harmless in some of these uh, trying times? Uh, we, we looked at that kind of legislation this year, uh, but none of it was ever uh, brought before a committee and it, uh, and it died, obviously. But those are some questions. Uh, we also have a tremendous amount of number of people, uh, winter visitors, that will be coming into this area. And we're going to have to deal with uh, their, uh, their entrance into our economy. Uh, Re-entrance, I guess, would be a better way to have it. So all of those things are important things that we're going to have to deal with in the next actually in the next few months yeah representative Shope, your your thoughts on COVID? well look i mean it's a it's a year like none other that we have have seen um or or at least those of us who didn't live through the spanish flu uh, at the beginning of the century so um look i think that 
uh, going forward, uh, you know, I continue to believe that uh, there was really, uh, I don't fault any governor of any state almost. I know that a lot of people have taken this and turned it into a political issue, but every event that I've been to, I've said, look, there wasn't a playbook in uh, whether you're the governor of New York or the governor uh, of Arizona on what, how to deal with this type of thing. Uh, like there is a playbook if you're the governor of Florida or Louisiana to deal with a hurricane or to, if you're the governor of California to deal with an earthquake. Um, those, those things exist. They happen often. Uh, and, and their governments react in a way that shows that they happen often. This is a, a once in a century type of event and it has been treated as such. And I think the people in all levels of government have done the best possible job that they can listening to uh, the experts in the field. Obviously, I'm not a doctor. Um, um, was a, you know, average student at Arizona State. So I listen to people on a regular occasion. Um, that being said, we have a situation right now where I'm Knudsen's thinking of as a superintendent of schools here in Florence. I think of him as a school board member in Coolidge of the safety for our staff, the safety for our students, uh, and, and, the, and the safety of the folks that end up going home. We have another situation in this county where I'm, you know, if you look at the statistics, where we have a high incarcerated population. And what has that done to um, kind of throw the uh, statistics out of whack? And on the flip side, are we may doing everything we possibly can to make sure that our corrections officers and other staff that go into those facilities are not introducing or into the prison or introducing into the regular community uh, a mass spread? So there's been complications all around. I think overall, uh, Arizona compared to uh, fairly well. Uh, we appear to be coming uh, uh, along a lot better than most other states, with the exception, and every state is going through this right now, of funding. I mean, people are not taking a lot of trips. However, the bright spot is, is places like Pinal County, which are a day's drive to get to Superior, to Boyce Thompson Arboretum, or down to Oracle State Park, or other places like that, Casa Grande Ruins, what have you. Uh, those places are, are doing better. Uh, because people want to get out and do something outside. We have, we have uh, hotels, and this is from the Arizona Lodging and Tourism Association, uh, who are on the outskirts of Phoenix or Tucson that are having better years uh, than normal because people want to actually travel, but they're only willing to travel as far as they feel comfortable driving. Um, I've done a couple flights myself. I wear a mask on a regular basis. Uh, um, my f wife tells me that it's because I need to make sure that I'm 100% healthy for our honeymoon after the election, but uh, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. And I, you know, I am not afraid of this. And I think that I think that one thing we have to keep in mind here is this: I think you can have Mr. Fillmore's view of of wanting to make sure that. Have be by the government to wear a mask or do something like that. As a business owner, I want my constitutional rights to be respected as well. Where if I have a sign up that says you are not permitted to enter my business, that um, that's going to be respected as well. It's a two-way street. The Constitution is there to protect uh, the citizenry from the government. Uh, so I, I think that we have to do all, all we'll have to do our part and allow ourselves. And I think most of us have. I think the overwhelming majority of us have, have allowed people a lot of grace during this period of time. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, uh, we've seen the viral videos of folks on either side of the issue out of control, but f most, most folks, most people out there have not um, been anything but graceful during this horrible and, and really just confusing time in many respects. We have mental illness, I think, that is out of control. We have, um, anecdotally, we know uh, from uh, businesses that sell spiritus liquors that there has never been a higher rate of purchase of spiritus liquors. What is that doing to uh, addiction out there? I speak to folks from Sun Life uh, uh, Medical Center that has uh, branches all around Pinal County, and they are seeing a higher rate of folks self um, We have to, we're going to have a serious uh, crisis, and we already have a serious crisis on our hand with COVID. 
but we can't um, we can't let up on the other crises that develop because of the um, solutions uh, to COVID as well. And that's something we really have to keep our eye on. And I, I know that I've been uh, speaking to those folks uh, quite a bit just to make sure that they have the resources necessary uh, um, because at some point we're going to open up the workforce again. And if you have addiction and if you have um, other issues that have been brought on by whether it's a lockdown or just the feeling that you can't get out and live your life, uh, you may not be employable. We want to make sure that everybody can go out and live their life. Uh, so these are these are very serious problems that really I don't think get the time that they should uh, when we talk about COVID. All right, uh, Representative Fillmore, building on that, uh, let's talk about next session, regular session. You, I'd ask you to start with what you think will happen, not perhaps what you want to happen, but what you think will happen, COVID related, and then give us a broader view of who's going to be in the majority, what your views are, what you want to do in the next session. Start with COVID first and then move in. Well, I'm going to stay away from the COVID. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? what? But, Wait a minute. But, but no, you know, uh, the, I actually dropped the bill last year and I'm going to drop it again in regards to vaccinations and things. I don't believe the government, any government has ever has the right to tell individuals that they must inoculate, die, uh, uh, drink or ingest or anything for themselves on their own body uh, and I got in uh, trouble because I even said tattooing on the bodies uh, you know uh, t on anybody or their children parents have the the right I think we all recognize that the COVID-19 is a new flu it's a new strain they've been coming for thousands of years they're going to continue coming for thousands of years common sense would dictate the loss of our freedoms, you know, and the increase in bankruptcy, o uh, opiate abuse, or alcoholism, the, the fear of socializing, the traumatization to our kids, I think is going to be a heavier toll on society than what we necessarily want to face. Next year in 2021 20, uh, at the legislature, I believe, first of all, I, in my heart, believe that we're going to have a red wave. I hope so. I believe that our country is right. I think we're, we're as a society across this country. I was reading an article. I was up in Oregon last week. They're, they're putting out a to the vote of the legalization of uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms. Now, in the 1960s, it's like, okay, that makes sense to me, but not, you know, no, I grew up. But I see uh, the, the idiocy of what's going on in our country, and, and, and it does scare me. I believe in 2021 at the legislature, the majority is going to stay in the Republican Party. I believe in 2021 that we are going to see a majority of the people who come back who are saying, we passed a bunch of bills. There was a reason we passed those bills. We had those committees, and they died. Let's revise them quick. Let's move them through the pipeline. Let's do what we got to do to take care of so we don't lose a year in our lives. And then we're going to deal with some of the issues that are coming up, not only because of uh, uh, COVID-19, but also because of uh, just a change in, uh, changes in society. If we have a red wave, I think that there will be a change possibly in some of the leadership positions. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing by any, may, uh, uh, any means or, or shake, but I think that some people's personalities will come out a little bit more. I think that because of COVID-19 that people are going to take a look at some of the issues with the governor's ability to shut us down. I think that every legislature would be well um, informed to stay up on that issue and to understand where the consternation is, is coming from the people. And uh, I think that we should look at, at, as quickly as possible, ensuring that our businesses are open up and that opportunity is there for us. And Mr. Barnes, it's back in your All right, state. thank you, Representative. I appreciate it. I heard a couple of things. You, you, in Code Talk, said we might have a new speaker. I'm sorry? I said in Code Talk, I heard you say we might have a new speaker. Is that what you meant? No. Uh, I, I think I said I'm not saying one way or another on that <laughs> issue. It's a good attempt to put me onto that issue. Nicely but, done. You know, Nicely but, done. I feel like I could ask you that directly. But I, I, there is, 
there, there is in both Republican and Democratic caucus in the House and in the Senate. There's a lot of there's a lot a of lot royal of talk right? about leadership. Right. I mean, it's self governance. Absolutely. It's self governance. No one's in charge. Right. It's only us. That is correct. And like uh, Mr. Cook would understand when we talk about water, it's very fluid. <laughs> very nicely done. Fluid. <laughs> All right. Nicely done. Ended. Mr. Pratt, can you do any better than that? Talk about uh, you're going from the Senate to the House after being in the House. Uh, the House is not going to be the same House you left. Uh, what's it going to look like? What are your thoughts about 2021 session? What, what interests you? Uh, well, there's, there's going to be a lot of changes there. Uh, assuming, uh, and, and we'll just, just for assumption, we'll, we'll, uh, we're going to assume that the Republicans are going to have the majority in the House. You don't sound as confident as, uh, as perhaps no, Mr. Fillmore. I'm, I'm just uh, hedging my bets here a little bit. But uh, no, I, I, I believe that we've done the right thing. And we have a good team, and uh, and we will have we will prevail. However, we will still have a very thin ma majority. I think that's going to be the biggest one of the biggest challenges. Uh, we've got we've got a lot of uh, issues uh, in, in personnel, obviously, and I'm talking about uh, not the speaker or or anybody in that position, but we have a lot of very experienced uh, legislators that have moved on. Uh, we are going to be losing both uh, the Judiciary Chairmen in House and Senate. We're going to be losing a Transportation uh, Chair in the House. We're going to uh, be losing a Commerce Chair so there are, uh, and, uh, and we've, we've got to backfill some of those positions. So that's, that's a lot of the things that we're going to, we're going to have to make some tough decisions, I think, or whoever the speaker is, is going to be making some tough decisions in the, in the near future. How, how much of it's going to be COVID related 2021? Uh, I think that, uh, I think the, the big uh, unknown is the mutation factor. Uh, we don't know for sure. We know that we know that is is a rapidly uh, growing or changing virus. Uh, so we know that there's going to be some mutation in that. And the question is, are we going to have the right kind of uh, Vaccinations and our people are going. Are people going to accept those vaccinations? So those are those are some of the big questions that I think we're going to be facing. Uh, then there's some other areas that uh, uh, we we've we've got a lot of water issues that are uh, let's say they're still unsettled. We we uh, we basically we passed a real big bill. But the reality is that there's still a lot of problems in the water area, everywhere from Mojave to La Paz County. Uh, we 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 know that there is already legislation that uh, that other people are preparing. Uh, we know that aug augmentation is going to be a big factor if we're going to continue growth, particularly in Pinal County because uh, uh, we have a finite amount of water in this time, I think, and that's my opinion. Uh, we, we don't know exactly what kind, of, um, what, what kind of dynamic or how, how the, how the uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly how we're gonna deal with some of these uh, issues right now it's going to be really interesting what uh, what happens in the next 21 days when when we have the numbers and then we know how the leadership is going to be uh, uh, you know starting to develop so I think those are some big big factors that are going to be happening in in the legislators specifically Appreciate it. Uh, Representative Shope, you've been a leader in the House. You're Speaker Pro Tem. I think of you as having a 
uh, functionality on budget stuff. Uh, when you talk about 2021, give us give us your thoughts on how COVID would play also uh, about our budget. I, I yeah. steal some of your thunder by saying, I think early on we all thought the budget was going to crater out and we were going to be in bad straits. Maybe that's not so true, but give us some. Yeah, maybe that isn't so true. I think that when we first started out, we were projecting anywhere from a half billion to $1.5 billion shortfall. Um, we have, you know, been for a multitude of reasons. The recovery in Arizona has been better than we expected in most sectors, uh, not all, obviously. Uh, but uh, uh, we're looking at CARES and other uh, federal stimulus have been helpful. Um, we're looking at about a 400-ish million dollar surplus uh, uh, going in, in in the next year. Uh, how does that play with COVID? I mean, look, there's going to be any number of things that are going to be uh, asked of us. I, I know that, um, especially for public sector areas, and I would put education in that, and and anything that you believe is uh, public sector. Um, you know, the uh, making sure that there's enough PPE, uh, for example, making sure that that every agency and every agency that uh, or every person that that agency comes in contact with has uh, what they feel is necessary to make sure that they're protected uh, going forward. And that's something I think you're going to see from state government to county government, local government, and it's already going on in many respects. Um, as as far so you've got you've got COVID out here that obviously sucks a lot of the oxygen out of the room uh, in, in the sense of talking about the budget. You've also got everything else that we always talk about in a budget year uh, that's out there. We've talked quite a bit about some of these things tonight about what we want, the infrastructure, roads, uh, uh, make sure that uh, Arizona's prime for development, et cetera. Uh, those are also part of the uh, budget conversation that is now in consideration and potentially in contention. Uh, uh, for for uh, attention uh, as as COVID is, um, look forward to to those conversations. I got to tell you, I can't leave here tonight without telling you how much, especially on the testing side uh, of of what's going on, how much we have our universities in Arizona to thank for the work that they've done and what they've been able to export to other states. Both Arizona State University and University of Arizona with the different test uh, uh, types that they have come uh, and brought to the table with have really changed the game. Um, what the, for those of you who are football fans of college football, what the Pac-12 conference started looking at about three weeks ago was something that Arizona State University had instituted about two months ago. Um, as far as the saliva tests and how quick those results, I took a saliva test um, about three week, uh, three, two, two, three months ago, I tweeted out about it. I got re my results in about 13 hours. Um, and that's in the entire test uh, itself took about uh, one or two minutes. Um, so, so these things are being developed. Uh, my hope is, is that whatever vaccine is developed in the future is depoliticized as much as possible. Uh, and we allow the, the science to rule the day on that. Um, and I look forward to, um, uh, to get into a point in time, especially on budget, where we can get back and, and say, hey, okay, well, this is what we need as far as what our medical folks and, and schools and et cetera need as far as COVID dollars, and we still have something left over that we don't have to take a year off. We did that before. When I first uh, was there um, for the first two or three years after the financial uh, disaster of, of the late uh, first decade of the 2000s, we were, had situations Vehicles. And anybody who served in any type of government knows that you're, you have to have that stuff on a schedule. You can't go a year without buying school buses. You can't go a year without buying a sheriff's vehicle or a police car or, or a, you know, maybe every few years with a garbage truck. We had vehicles that were at 200, 300,000 miles on them. Uh, we can't get into that situation again. So that's what I mean whenever I say, yes, COVID is there, but we can't, we have to also recognize that government still has a function to play out in other things as well that are, that are very important. And once you get behind on those things, it is very, very difficult and can take multiple budget years to come back from. And as far as the, uh, you know, the forecast goes for next year, uh, look, it's, uh, I, I know one thing is true. And I won't have to bang my gavel nearly as much, or at all, being in the Senate, because I won't be the Speaker pro tem over uh, a anymore, but, but it's, uh, it'll be a fantastic, if you don't think it's a close election, $12 million has already been sp uh, spent on legislative races in Arizona. Um, 
we still have three weeks to go. That shattered a record, I think, a month and a half ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the um, dollars that have come into Arizona, I remember having a dinner at an event about four years ago, and I was with some legislators from Florida. And I asked him, because he could begin to see the tea leaves changing, that Arizona was moving potentially into a so, so what is that like, uh, to live in Florida, knowing that every single election is contested every single you know, two years, four years, whatever? And they said, just picture watching a football game, and every single commercial is a political commercial. Well, I think we live that reality now, don't we? So we know what that's like. Um, the amount of dollars uh, being invested in the state tells you how how uh, sought after it is, and it's not just the prices. It goes to the state legislature as well. So um, I, I I think I heard it earlier today. Anybody running for office, I mean, this goes for my opponents. This goes for for. Uh, you know what the next three weeks on any of them if you know of any of them or friends with any of them uh shoot a text and just tell them you that uh you still love them even though you've seen all these awful things about them whenever you've gone out to the mailbox uh because that's until you've had that happen to you until you've had a uh a, a box and call you up and how awful things are you really haven't experienced uh experience what this is and i think anybody who decides to go and do this whether it's at this level level above or at a municipal level deserves respect because this is a crappy time of year to be a candidate I appreciate that as an aside uh, Phoenix television markets the number one political spend in all the United States more than Chicago more than Houston more than New York seven consecutive weeks yeah because we are a swing state and Phoenix is a big market Chicago is not a swing state, so they're not getting the, the commercial love. But it's not every bus in the country that sees what we see. McSally, Kelly, Biden, Trump, Kelly, McSiden. You know, it, that's us. So it's a, it's a really rare time in Arizona. We get to make a big difference. All right, we have less than 10 minutes available before Mr. Goodman comes up and says goodbye to everyone. Is there someone in the audience that has a burning question? If so, stand up and shout it out, and uh, one of these three gentlemen will hit it. Yes sir. yes, sir. At the podium, please. Yeah, the mic's on. Right the there. Mike. Thank you for She's coming over to help you. She's right behind you. I don't think so. Anyhow, I think I can talk loud enough that, first of all, I'd like to thank the panel for being here and also for Representative Shope and, and Pratt to uh, your responses for COVID-19 in the pandemic. Uh, coronavirus has been around for 20 years or more. COVID-19 just came about. So there was no playbook. So the governor and everyone else has done what they were supposed to do. And that's the health and welfare of the citizens. Now, I'd like to applaud you for those responses. However, I'd like to get back to the water issue with uh, Johnson Utilities. I know it's been mentioned that there's a seller and a buyer. The last meeting that I attended with EPCOR, they were talking upwards of $300 million to repair and replace items within that infrastructure. Who's going to pay for that? That's my question. Who's going to pay for that? We keep hearing about growth within Santan Valley and the surrounding areas, even Queen Creek. But again, uh, as I, I told my wife many years ago, I, I came from government. I worked 33 years with city government, five with federal. And I told my wife, I said, whoever has the most water as a utility wins. Now here we are, we came from Ohio to here, and we're having water issues. My understanding is that Nevada, California, and Arizona, you have to come with an agreement of what you're going to get from Lake Mead. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Or is it even close? Or oh, yeah, yeah. Correct. So, last yeah, it's year already, that's already written in, and that's been the case for 
you know, since the completion of the Central Arizona project before then. Okay, but didn't last year they came to an agreement in part of Pinal County, the farmers had to restrict water usage? Did that take place? Yep. Yeah. That's so, yep. I mean, again, whoever has the most water, for the most part, wins. But talking about upwards of $300 million to correct one private water company and their infrastructure, who's paying for that? That's what I want to know. Who wants to take that hot potato of you three? <laughs> Anyone? I can tell the answer is rate payers, but I'll yeah. let them explain what that means. Yeah, what does that mean exactly? And I think what, one, of the, one of the great things about what's going on right now, knock on wood, it continues to go on because I think for any of us that have been in an area and especially dealing with water for any period of time, we've, we've had uh, near misses uh, in the past um, uh, with this utility. So um, the good thing is, is the purchaser, Epcor Water has a lot of ratepayers uh, in a sense that it's not going to be incumbent on Santan Valley citizens. Now, this is my opinion to you. I would argue to them it should not be incumbent solely on Santan Valley citizens to pay for this entire $300 million. First off, you ought to be going for what's probably in the bank, you know, that's been hidden aside for several years and what led to uh, us and uh, me asking and basically demanded the Corporation Commission come to uh, hiring an interim manager to take the utility over. Uh, but the re reality is, is that, w you know, if you're going to be purchased by an entity, having there being, I can go to them and say, you know what, this should not be, uh, th every shareholder is going to, across the country, is going to benefit in the long run here. So this should not be shouldered by this community. So that, that would be my argument to them. Okay, well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Supervisor Goodman here for stepping up and taking the lead with the, uh, or working with the Arizona Corporation Commission to get things done because I was here, uh, I transferred out here in 2012 and I heard about water issues then and it continued to build over time and it took years for anything to get done and then uh, Supervisor Goodman, along with the Arizona Corporation Commission, got involved, and my understanding was that EPCOR signed a seven-year contract to be interim manager, mm -hmm. and they're into, I think, two years, two and a half. So if they do purchase it, then it, that's null and void, and they can continue doing what they're doing. And that's reclaiming that whole water system that has just been a joke for the most part. They let the infrastructure decay and didn't do anything about it. And I hope they get that company pennies on a dollar if they do get it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, sir. Uh, we probably have time for one more if anyone else has one. Yes, please, go right ahead. I'm going to take my mask off, otherwise I sound like an old lady. <laughs> Not that I'm a young chick. But <laughs> um, we have a law on the books that forbids Pinell County uh, communities to incorporate unless they get approval from the surrounding communities. I don't think that that law is on the books for every county within the state of Arizona. So I'd just like to know why we were singled out and while, while you know, the talk is all in good about bringing businesses here. A lot of people don't think it's going to happen until Santan Valley incorporates. And I do believe our population in Santan Valley is higher than some of the other communities that are incorporated in Pinell County. So what can you guys do to put us on a level playing field? Gentlemen, anyone want to talk to that? <laughs> Going once. A lot of backbone uh, up here. <laughs> yeah, no. I, uh, you know, uh, the law, to my understanding, was in effect for a while, and it was not so there to, uh, to uh, uh, signal to Pinal County. But I believe that it is up to the people in the community to vote whether or not they want to incorporate 
But I also believe that some of the uh, adjoining cities, Apache Junction, Florence, and Queen Creek have uh, been maneuvering to get the benefit that they can of some of the growth to stop some of the, the initiative. I would favor any legislation to enable the people in uh, Santan to make the decision. And that ties in with the water issue uh, with Johnson Ranch. Um, I think, sir, with all due respect, you're going to be paying for a lot of that water and some of that. There's going to be higher rates. But I believe the state has a responsibility to step up and to aid in that uh, endeavor in, in taking that. So uh, Santan Incorporation has been a very volatile issue over the years, and it will continue to be. But I think that's got to be left up to the local people to decide. Yeah, and I would say that for, for me, I voted for every every measure that's been before me to go ahead and make it easier to do so. My and I, I think I addressed it maybe 20 minutes ago. I think you all should have the with your your future, and that goes for whether it's a city, fire district, you know, the way your schools look, things like that. You all have that ability. Right, because there's a lot of, uh, of our community that's being chiseled off by neighboring towns or cities. And we all know that it's, it's an economic decision as well as a right to govern. And the smaller our area gets, the smaller share of state shared revenue we'll be able to rely on. And it, it's just been very frustrating because we've had people come out and fight us publicly from surrounding communities when they really didn't have a voice in it. So it got real tough the last time, but I'm, I'm hoping we can get the legislation changed so that we can move forward and really have the same thing Queen Creek and Florence and Casa Grande have. We want a police department. We want to make decisions for our future. We don't want to sit back and let somebody else dictate what we will and won't do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Goodman, I think we've reached the end, although... Does walking I, I yes. Make a comment? yes, Mr. Pratt, go ahead. Uh, I ran legislation in 2010 that that was uh, uh, based on the correction of uh, what was going to happen around in the state. Uh, my legislation got picked apart, but uh, it still exists because it was moved f into another legislator's domain. And it's a lot of the lot of the laws, the, a lot of the work that I did in 2010 still exists. Uh, it's been used in Vail, I think, and in a few other different towns around the state of Arizona. So a lot of that legislation that we that was groundbreaking uh, legislation in 2010 still exists on the books. Uh, there, there were a couple of pieces that did not get uh, incorporated into it, but uh, a lot of the laws are still in existence, and and they will they will be better, very beneficial in the future. I'll just put it that way. You got it. All right. Uh, please go right ahead. Yeah, I'm Chris Knutson. I'm superintendent here in Florence Unified School District. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to thank you guys for coming tonight and anytime uh, you want to use our facilities I believe that uh, our schools are the center of our community and I, I think it's appropriate that uh, we open the schools up for, for uh, events like this I can tell you that I was in meetings starting in March with the governor and superintendent Hoffman and you guys are right I think that uh, when was the last time you saw a, a Republican and a, Dem a Democrat come together and work together for the good of our kids in, in our state? And they did that. And I, I was witness to many of those meetings where decisions the last eight months. Um, I can tell you that we went back to school this past week in person. 
and we've already had a high school shut down by the county health department and tonight the county health department shut down J.O. Combs High School so at Santam Foothills we had two three teachers and two kids test positive and I guess my question is you know when we made the decision to come back to in-person school this was this was how we did it in my district I let the parents decide if they wanted to stay online or if they wanted to stay come back in person I let the teachers decide if they wanted to stay online or if they wanted to come on person back in person and we started up with you know basically what happened 30 percent of the population decided to leave their kids online and do virtual learning and you know 70 percent decided to uh, come back in person as far as the teachers went 50 of them wanted accommodations to st uh, I'm sorry 30 wanted accommodations to stay online but we needed 50 teachers to move over online so we had to move some teachers over to, to uh, online instruction that wanted to be back in person. And my question to you is, if all of those individuals look at the inherent risks of catching COVID-19, like me, myself, with heart disease and diabetes and being overweight, I've been back at work the whole time. And I looked at the risks of catching COVID-19 and I'm willing to come back to work. And I think a lot of these individuals that have sent their kids back to school and the teachers that want to be in the classroom with their kids, they've weighed the risks of catching the disease and, and they've made a conscious decision to come back. And here I am one week in and I'm shutting down, I mean the, the county health department shut down our school. and people are are up in arms with me about why i would let my school shut down and my question is is there any way we can get some help with somebody to say hey these individuals over here feel like they want to stay home and they they and we want to respect that but we also have these individuals over here that now that's gone in at Santan Foothills High School for 14 days and at now probably 14 days at J.O. Combs High School and I guess is this going to be the new normal because I feel like I'm hurting cats you know I mean I was in a meeting today with all the superintendents of Pinal County we're all pulling our hair out because you know we feel like we're stuck in the middle here and you know there are two sides on how people feel about this um, you know right up here the way you feel and the way you feel you're opposite on the on how you feel about it you know we mandate this so my question also is if if we mandate the wearing of masks and we do our best to make sure I mean 75 percent drop since the governor started saying put one of these on so this helps in mitigating the spread of COVID-19 now we can't so save social distance on the bus or in classrooms but we can do the best to try to keep our teachers six feet away wearing a mask. So when maybe an outbreak does happen, which has happened at this school, not an outbreak, but we've had people that have been positive here, but we didn't get shut down because we could show that everyone's wearing this mask and they're staying six feet apart. So we're going to do our part to try to try to deal with this moving forward so we don't get shut down again. But uh, it's just been real frustrating for a lot of us and I, and I know we're all in this together and everybody truly needs to be nice to one another that's the most important thing but uh, I don't know we need some help thank you superintendent I appreciate that I, I think what is you've just heard is going to be my own estimate having seen 32 legislative sessions since 1989 is going to be the center of the 2021 legislative session right it's, it's just going to be because that's where the public is and it's going to circle around i've been thinking maybe like many in the room that march through may june that this thing would subside and go back but we're not i'm actually going to buy a damn permanent mask because i'm going to have to wear it for the next year I have a couple it feels here like to give out yes so I, I give in no more paper masks i got a real one well, it's, it's a lot easier on a K-6 level because we're, we're, we're able to group these, these K-6 graders 
together as groups. So like for instance, at Anthem K-8 school, we had a kindergartner teacher t uh, uh, kid test positive. County Health comes in, does their tracing. Those kids are on quarantine, just that class, but it doesn't shut the school down. So the problem is at the high school level where we have kids that, you know, they have six classes. So, you know, when, and, and, and I believe how it happened at, at Foothills is volleyball coach caught COVID, a couple of volley, two volleyball players caught it. And the next thing you know, they, they contact Trace from the county, 371 kids have to quarantine and 20 teachers. So, I mean, it, it's just, um, it's very, it's been very difficult this week in dealing with this situation. And, you know, I talked with Sherry today and she's in the same boat. I mean, we're all like, man, I mean, is this gonna be the new normal where we come back to school for three days and then we're shut down for two weeks? I mean, how can we honestly do that? It, 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 is, it, it is like herding cats. Sorry. I, no, I, I, was, I, I received the notes from Sherry Waltz, the superintendent of Coolidge, today. So I, I had a little bit of time to digest what you're just saying right now. And, I, and it doesn't get any better with a few hours of digestion, I can tell you that. Oh. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm but, better than I was on Sunday when yeah. I, after Saturday meeting with the county health department. But, I mean, is this the new normal? My, hope, my hope is that, and what I have argued is that I think that you should be able to um, if, if you have the staff to go ahead and go in person and the parents have the need or desire to send their student and we all know the inherent risks but well, are willing to wear this oh well we're the only district and, that in, in nobody caught COVID-19 because we mandated this to be in we had a track meet in June where we flew in 500 athletes from across the country that descended here on this high school. Everyone was mandated to wear a mask, and we followed up two weeks later to see if anybody caught it, and nobody did. So I, I've, I'm a firm believer in this. So if we can sit, do the best we can to save social distance and put a mask on, I, I, want, I want school to happen yeah. because 70% of our population that attends this school, that's what they want. Right. So I, I want to do whatever I can to help you, Chris. I don't know. I guess that's my message back is that whatever I think you're right. And I think that's the same way the parents feel in Coolidge. And I think that you'd go throughout the rest of the district. And I think we'd all want to help do whatever we can to make sure that happens. And on, on that issue, sir, I think you are right that it's the school superintendent and the board, the board should make the decisions in conjunction with the parents, understanding the risks and utilizing common sense, the mask and things of that nature uh, approach, you should be allowed to open. And I don't think that the health department should be able to come in and overrule uh, on that issue. And that's where I think the overreach in government has extended over the last year, was that rather than using common sense, uh, in shutting down certain businesses, allowing Walmart to stay open when they have a jewelry store, but shutting every jewelry store in the state, allowing Walmart to stay open when they have a sporting goods store and shutting every sporting goods store in the state. Common sense from the parents and the board and the superintendent, it should be your authority and you should open up. Well, our, our board voted to uh, not shut down and the only entity that can shut down the school is the county health department. I'm not a I'm not a medical health professional. Neither is the board. I mean, when we have outbreaks of other things, there are times when the county health department comes in and shuts us down. I, I'm just uh, I'm 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 kind of lost right now. And I think most superintendents in the state right now are feeling the heat right now. And and uh, um, like you see a lot of sheriffs. Uh, and, and, and police officers across the country that are leading, resigning over a lot of things. I'm seeing my friends retiring because of they're, they're under immense pressure right now. Um, I make a decision to shut a school down. There'll be 50 people with pitchforks outside my office. I met with some today, you know, and I'm like, listen, this is not my decision. And I showed the letter I got from the health department and I said, this is the decision. I'm not gonna fight the government on this because I already lost against the, the, the uh, state fire marshal. 
We built 600 uh, PPE protections with PVC pipe and uh, vinyl, vinyl uh, clear uh, coverings to put between kids in classrooms. And we weren't allowed to use them after we made 600 of them because uh, it's a fire issue, you know. So we had to go and spend $30,000 on uh, purchasing plexiglass shields just for the teachers. And, you know, so I'm not going to take on the health department and I'm not going to take on the fire marshal. I'm not doing that. But uh, we would love your help, guys. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, Supervisor Goodman, we'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Chris, I'm county, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I did, by the way. I, I got them all, so don't worry about that. <laughs> you know, first of all, I'd like to express our gratitude to our panel for being here and taking the time to come here. Obviously, there's still a lot more that needs to be discussed and have some more honest, open discussions. We had a discussion in regards to the purchasing of EPCOR, purchasing Johnson Utilities, and some of the additional work that needs to go in to rebuild this infrastructure. And, and so I would recommend that all of us, and though everybody listening, all of our citizens in particularly here in the Santan Valley, weigh in with the Corporation Commission with some of your concerns because they're the ones that ultimately will be making the decisions with the go on of the cell and everything of that nature. And so I would strongly recommend that we as citizens here in this area weigh in on these type of issues. When it comes to we need to be working more with our, our county health department, Chris, and, and we've got other schools in the area as we continue to keep that dialogue. We work a lot with the state health department and they collaborate one with another with all the health departments in some of these and there's guidelines that our state health department follows and that's from the state level coming down so as we go forward we need to keep these dialogues open so in connection with that we want to thank the school district for opening your doors here thank you for making this all right, well that's what I love about you Chris and we appreciate you doing that I would be amiss if I didn't point out that we have some individuals here from the county level that actually has been a big part of helping us pull this off and get this broadcasted out. We've got James Daniels, who's over our communication department, who has done a tremendous job to make sure that everything is working and functioning for the Facebook Live. Then I have my two assistants. I always refer to them as my we. So I, when I say we're gonna get stuff down, it's actually those two that are actually out there doing the footwork and everything else, and I appreciate them. But totally to our staff at the county level and for the work that they try to do. And then Tammy, I know you're trying to hide back there. She's actually been designated as our liaison with our state representatives and at legislation. She's been a tremendous help in helping us do that. And, I, and then you as the citizens here, thank you for your time and for coming here and making and being part of these and great, thank you for the great questions. Thank you and good night. And we look forward to continuing this process as we move forward. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh. <laughs> well. When was the last time a lobbyist got a gift this anyway? This is a complete polar opposite of my reality. <laughs> is this, is this? Hey, on behalf of the county, for you coming and, and helping us out with this form, we appreciate you being here. Thank you, I appreciate it. The, the back of your head's looking at Facebook right now, so okay. turn around and smile. <laughs> All right, thank you for being here. Thank you for doing this, I appreciate it. It's good to be with these gentlemen. We'll see you again in another forum, huh? That's right. Okay, thanks everybody. Woohoo!